Continuing with our every other week schedule right now for podcast on the brink with a lack of actual sports uh, in, in the collegiate landscape to talk about, but still plenty uh, to discuss off the field and off the court and to help us make sense of the last couple of weeks. We welcome back Zach Osterman of the Indianapolis Star to podcast on the brink. How you doing, Zach? Hey, good to be back. So it's uh, a weird time for, for those of us who are co- who cover college sports. Uh, for you right now, you'd, you'd be getting ready for the first IU football game of the season. Uh, that's obviously not going to happen anytime soon now. But off the field, there's there's been a lot um, over the last month. Uh, we've had earlier this month, I believe, the Big Ten – had a announcement of a schedule for football uh, only to come out, I think, five days later, five or six days later, and say they weren't going to play. We've had parents protesting the decision. We've had a lot of players speaking out against the decision. We've had some school presidents in the Big Ten uh, being willing to talk about the decision. We've had others not. Um, Just from your perspective, how how do you kind of analyze and grade – just the Big Ten in general, uh, how they've handled this whole situation. Obviously, the approach has been uh, more proactive than the SEC and, and the Big 12 and the ACC in terms of, you know, kind of saying that we're going to postpone. But but in general, you know, I, I think fairly the Big Ten's taken some heat uh, for how they've handled the situation. Just how do you kind of uh, summarize and, and, and your thoughts on, on how they've uh, kind of managed the whole situation so far? Yeah, I think the, the two things I sort of find myself saying up front in, in whenever we talk about this, number one, remember that what got us here was a virus. You know, none of this is happening without the virus. Um, you know, that, that, is the, that is the underlying condition here. Um, number two, this is absolutely one of those situations where we will not know until we have the benefit of hindsight, who was right. And that's, you know, if, if, if the SEC and ACC and Big 12 play a college football season with, you know, minimal disruption and no real, um, you know, no real catastrophe, then we'll look at this and say, hey, the Big 10, the Pac-12, they were, you know, too cautious. They, um, you know, they were too careful and it cost them if, as I think some people still suspect, uh, we get to, let's say, mid-late September and the climate uh, around college athletics is such that, you know, those three conferences, those three power five conferences that are pressing on, you know, decide to say, hey, we, we just can't do this. Then we'll look back and say, whatever the whatever the, the sort of issues, whatever the process issues, the Big Ten made the right decision um, and they made it early and therefore they made it in the absolute best interest of their athletes. Um, how it has been handled is another story. And I think that the, the biggest issue really more than anything else, like there's, there's stuff about it that's sort of window dressing. Like when people, for example, complain about the release of the schedule, then cancellation a week later, I've said many times they needed to release the schedule because they needed to give teams the green light to start fall camp. Uh, while they clearly still were not prepared to, make a a final uh, decision on the season um but the 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 glaring issue has just been the lack of transparency and the lack of explanation um you know tom allen we talked to tom allen on a zoom call thursday and he wasn't particularly critical of the big 10 you know he wasn't flying off the handle he wasn't you know it, it wasn't some sort of scott frost level airing of grievances But he did say something that I think summed the situation up well, whether he intended to or not. He said that in his experience, um, when there is a lack of communication, what rushes in to fill that void first is negativity. Um, And that is what you've seen. And it's, it's, you know, the the Big Ten kind of had a blueprint. The Pac-12 released, you know, summary documentation with its decision saying, this is why we came to this conclusion. Here are the things that we're citing, the studies, the information, whatever. Um, you may not agree with it, but this is our stance. This is our position, and here's why. It took the 
And, you know, it, it, when Kevin Warren finally did re- sort of release that, that open letter, uh, it was a two page letter. It, it explained the big 10's decision. It, it, it was, it was all the reasons you would have imagined. Um, it, it wasn't like anything in there was a galloping shock. Um, but it opened Warren up to a new round of criticism. And uh, I think, you know, listen, I think this has been a bit of a trial by fire. I think this whole year, frankly, has been a bit of a trial by fire for Kevin Warren. Um, you know, I, I don't, I think that I understand why the big 10 did not necessarily think they needed to hire, you know, let's say like a mid-major conference commissioner to be their new conference commissioner. But it, it was basically the worst possible year to a replace Jim Delaney and B replace him with someone who was going to take a little time to really get settled into the way of doing things in college. Um, I actually think, and, and I'm, this is not so much to absolve Kevin Warren of, of criticism as to point out uh, he's not alone in this, this boat. Uh, and I've written this, he needs more support than he's getting from his presidents and chancellors. You know, that, the, the we've heard that the vote was not unanimous, but it was, you know, it was in, there was an overwhelming consensus, quote unquote. Um, He uh, he's been the one that's kind of had to go out there and sell it, but it wasn't his decision. This, this, this comes down to the COPC, the council of presidents and chancellors. And yet when there was this outcry for explanation, basically no one really did anything. I think, I think in the first day or two, Michigan state's president released a statement on social media. And that was about the extent of what I saw. And, you know, the, the, the sort of the overarching point here is you can criticize Kevin Warren, but the the COPC pick and they're, they're the people that have empowered him to run the conference. And they're the people therefore that he needs the most support from the idea that he would just walk into that room and tell them how they were voting is, is a gross misunderstanding of, of how that relationship should work and does work, and frankly, even worked with Jim Delaney when Delaney had been at the Big Ten for ages. Um, so it, 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 nobody has, you know, really kind of covered themselves in glory in this. Um, I know there are some parent protests outside Big Ten headquarters this morning as we talk on Friday, the 21st of August. You know, one way or another, it does feel like we can close the book now on this. By and large, there will be no fall sports in the Big Ten. Only time will tell us whether that was the right decision or not. Um, it has it has not been a great episode for a lot of the conference's leadership. But I'd also say, particularly given that you're talking about a first-year uh, commissioner who has spent the majority of his tenure thus far – trying to run the conference in the midst of an unprecedented global pandemic. Um, You know, I I think this can potentially be more instructive than destructive to kind of everyone's long-term interests in in the conference, if that makes sense. Yeah, Zach, I think you brought up an important point and and one that that I may have missed. Um, Actually, as my dog starts barking here in the background, the, the beauty of podcasting uh from home during a pandemic the dog may bark in the background at any time but but Zach you brought you brought up a an interesting point there about Warren and just kind of the fact that he's been really thrown uh, under the bus for his handling of the situation when in many ways it may not be uh his decision to make uh, you know it's the it's the chancellors and presidents that ultimately uh do make that call so you know some of the the reaction to to what he is how he has handled this um I think has been a little bit unfair, but from an i u specific perspective, I think one of the things that's that's been a little bit frustrating for me and you kind of alluded to this on Twitter earlier in the week you know I, I believe you've asked for comment multiple times from the president's office just in terms of just kind of some insight on maybe you know what the thinking was in the decision you haven't gotten any response and yet we have a situation now where IU students have come back to campus and I think just less than 12, 15 hours after there was some videos that circulated on social media of of students congregating, you have Michael McRobbie sending an email to the student body kind of admonishing them for their behavior. 
what do you kind of make of the the unwillingness of the of the university uh, leadership to make any comment on uh, the athletic standpoint of this? And, and are you surprised at all that there's not been at least just a statement or some kind of explanation offered? You know, I think um, it's yes, and in one sense, no. I mean, I've I've I have requested comment through this process in the last two weeks, I think four different times from Michael McRobbie. And, and it's worth pointing out um, that is not just because Michael McRobbie is a big 10 president. He's also um, the immediate past chair of the COPC. He's on the, uh, I think it's called the executive committee of the COPC. He's one of the longest tenured presidents in the conference. You know, he's, he's someone who would have a significant voice in, in that discussion. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's worth pointing out he's also not alone. And, you know, this is, this is something that I think is particularly uh, – the Big Ten is, is distinct in this way from many other conferences, not, you know, necessarily all, but bar Northwestern, every, every school in the Big Ten fits pretty much the same profile. They're all big state schools, land grant schools. Everyone except Nebraska is in the uh, American Association of Universities, and Nebraska actually was, and then got kicked out, um, or well, voted out, kicked out. Probably is a little bit of a, an exaggeration. Um, you know, th- the point is these are all people whose salaries are ostensibly paid with public money, and you know, to to suggest that they should not have to address this publicly um, when there are a lot of, when this affects a lot of people's lives and livelihoods, and there are a lot of people who want to know more about this decision-making process. You know, I I don't, I don't think that's particularly fair. Um, What I would say, and this is another area where I go back to saying, I think this should be more instructive to the conference than destructive is I'm not sure that in the past, um, we would have necessarily done this, but I think that's because Jim Delaney would have had a better handle on basically how to how to manage this from the beginning. And that just comes down as much as anything else to Delaney's time on the job, to his relationship with the university presidents and chancellors, and, and to his standing in college athletics, all things that Kevin Warren really can't be shouldn't be criticized for because he's only been commissioner since January. You can't just make Kevin Warren a seven year veteran of the big 10 overnight. He has to have the time to do that. And of course it's been, unfor- it's been terribly unfortunate for him um, that, you know, his first year winds up being probably the biggest challenge of his tenure. So you, you really are just like thrown into the deep end with lead shoes um, and asked to swim it's it's incredibly difficult for him and and I think that not that not that you should sort of just be giving everyone a pass for you know every decision that goes wrong or or isn't explained or is unpopular but do remember the position that he's in um and the position that you know he's 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 trying to navigate the conference through and so then that's where it comes back to this idea that I think if this happens Five years ago, the presidents maybe don't really talk much. Maybe the, 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 the chair of the COPC, and I have not seen a statement from Morton Shapiro, the, the president of, or I don't know if he's a president or a chancellor, um, but, but the head of Northwestern. Um, it's possible he has talked and I just haven't seen it. Um, but, you know, five years ago, Delaney looks at this and says, okay, you know, I help you understand the nature of this, this decision you all make this decision. And then as commissioner, as, as the most public face of the big 10, I take it out and sell it. You know, I, 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 I go out and I, uh, you know, I basically present and back our decision because that's part of my job. And I think Kevin Warren um, has tried to do that. I, I think, you know, I, I don't want to put words in his mouth. I, I don't know if maybe he's underestimated the degree to which, you know, people would demand more of an explanation. I'm not sure. But that's where it sort of comes back to this idea that I think his his presidents and chancellors needed to be more aware of, well, listen, this is, you know, his first really big moment um, in that job. And, 
you know, we need to be there to support him if, if anything, if there's anything that, that needs supporting. Um, because it just, it, again, I think people have become so accustomed to the Big Ten seeming like the most sort of functional and harmonious conference in the country. And it, it probably was, at least at the Power Five level. But that's because Jim Delaney had been around so long that he had the relationships and the cachet and to some extent, the political power as well to basically keep everyone, you know, everybody's oar in the water and pulling in the same direction. Kevin Warren, people have criticized Kevin Warren saying, well, he doesn't understand. He doesn't have those relationships and this and that. Well, of course he doesn't. He's a first year commissioner. You know, if if this was his seventh year and this, this happened this way, you'd look at it and say, well, geez, what, you know, what, what's going on in the big 10 but it's, you know, he hasn't even been on the job 12 months. He needs that time. And in the interim, he needs the support of the people around him. And I just don't know that he's gotten it so much. And, and listen, on the one hand, I understand why individual presidents, maybe Nebraska notwithstanding, and I keep making, you know, backhanded reference. I should probably stop. But I understand why individual presidents would, want, would, would not want to speak out of turn. Um, and would not want, because what you don't want is what happens when, let's say, Nebraska, um, you know, comes out and says all these things, and all of a sudden it throws the conference into chaos. It's, are our teams going to try and break away? Our team's going to just sort of play their own season? What does that do to the conference's harmony? What is it, you know, is that even allowable under conference rules? And on and on. So I understand in one sense the presidents would, would not, presidents and chancellors would want to speak as one voice. But if you see your committee with this, and you know it's his first, you know it's his first big crisis, and it's going to be difficult to navigate, and it, it comes with myriad challenges, you know, and and we have absolutely no blueprint for how to deal with something like this in in you know modern history, in modern Big Ten history. That's where you you need to step up and find a way to be more supportive, and I think that applies to Michael McRobbie, you know, uh, I think frankly it it applies again to all of them. Um, and particularly not to dismiss uh, Shapiro at, at Northwestern, but his is a private school, particularly the presidents at the big state institutions, you know, they're paid, their salaries are paid with public dollars, um, at least at the most fundamental level. And therefore, if the, if there is a significant enough public outcry for explanation of something, I think they're owed that. I think that's fair. I think it's fair to say one of the biggest concerns for Big Ten coaches from a football perspective is the ramifications if somehow the ACC, the SEC, and the Big 12 have their season and move forward and find uh, some level of success with it and and are able to complete the season and have a playoff that doesn't include the Big Ten. What do you feel the long-term ramifications for the Big Ten would be if – that becomes the reality is it something that's going to have a lasting impact or do you feel like it's you know something that can be easily overcome in the next uh in in the foreseeable future that i mean that is the sixty four thousand dollar question that if i had a a perfect answer to i'd make a lot more money than i do right now um i I mean it, it would be damaging there is no question about that it would be damaging obviously to the Big Ten brand, and I suppose to the Pac-12 brand as well. Um, you know, it would also be damaging. I mean, I'm working on a story basically asking what sort of financial arrangement can be made between the broadcasters and the conference when you have this dynamic where the broadcasters are now not getting what they're paying for. But on the other hand, it does ESPN and Fox no good if the Big Ten is financially crippled. So, you know, do you – that's probably going to be some sort of negotiation to figure out how that money flows. You know, do, do ESPN and Fox still front the big 10 some money just to help, you know, keep the departments running and, and everything, you know, somewhat copacetic while the big 10 figures out how to make a winter season work. Well, guess what? That that's a totally different conversation. If the SEC, ACC and big 12 wind up playing full seasons and ESPN can say, well, you didn't do that. You know, if, if everybody cancels, then the Big Ten's position is clear. Hey, you know, we, 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 we all tried. Yes, we moved more quickly, but that's because we wanted to be more cautious. We are committed to trying to figure out a way to play in the winter or the spring, but we need you to work with us. And ESPN says, yeah, well, you know, nobody, nobody could 
make it happen. So we'll work with you. We'll figure this out. Um, it gets more complicated if, you know, just financially as well as anything else, if those three conferences can complete a season. Um, and, and it is worth saying, too, as we kind of discuss this in a lot of different ways, the, the, the general public sentiment right now basically seems to be that if any one of those three conferences shuts it down, they all will. That, that we're, we're basically at kind of the last, the last breaking point, so to speak. Um, but it, I mean, the, the damage, listen, it's not like the big 10 would become a second class citizen overnight. The big 10 still has Ohio state. It still has, you know, I mean, it still has, it still has some of the most like fundamental strengths that any conference could have. It has massive alumni bases. It, it stretches from the Midwest all the way to the East coast. It, you know, it touches, many of this country's largest television markets. Um, you know, people are still going to, people are still going to tune in to see Michigan, Ohio state on the Saturday, you know, the Saturday afternoon after Thanksgiving, like that, that's always going to happen forever. So it's not like the sec is just going to quash the big 10 if that happens. And, and, you know, the big 10's days are numbered. Um, but it would be damaging. There, there's, there's no doubt about that. It, it would be very difficult, um, for the conference uh, to, to move, I think, financially um, and also in terms of the optics, frankly, of a, you know, a, a just a lost, a lost season that maybe didn't have to be. So shifting gears uh, a little bit, Zach, you're in Bloomington and students are beginning to return to campus. I know there's been a pretty comprehensive uh, COVID-19 testing uh, program put into place. We've seen, I believe, a couple other Big, big Ten schools already kind of go online only after some, uh, some issues. Uh, we've seen already, as I mentioned earlier, situation in Bloomington, uh, some video on social media where IU Bloomington felt compelled to respond to some behavior um, from the students uh, that, that I guess was deemed unacceptable. However, I would kind of counter that uh, with as somebody who's attended IU Bloomington, and, and I'm sure you can speak to this as well. Uh, being on campus in Bloomington, you're, there's, there's going to be a certain segment of the population that's just not going to adhere to uh, the social distancing aspect of it. Uh, there's going to be people that, that want to go out and, and kind of do what they want. And that, we've seen that in, in all parts of society throughout this pandemic. So what, what, I mean, what's, what's it been like being in Bloomington, um, seeing students come back? Is it, have you noticed uh, kind of a change in, in terms of uh, just how the city operates traffic and things like that? And what do you kind of think of, of how things are going so far? It It seems like, to me, and, and, and I've, I haven't really uh, hidden my feelings on this, but, you know, the, this whole um, decision to bring students back uh, obviously is, is driven uh, a lot by the, the financial aspect of it. Um, and, and I wonder, from a practical standpoint, are, are we setting uh, most of these students up to, to fail just because the, the, the whole notion of, of being on a campus, especially one like I use and a lot of these other large state schools where you have tens of thousands of students, it, it, it to me just doesn't seem like a, a viable strategy uh, to stop a, a transmission of, of, of COVID-19 uh, when you've got people living in dorms and, and fraternity houses and, and congregating like they are. Yeah. I mean, listen, I, I've, I've heard criticism too. And, and I, I, you know, I kind of maybe sit on a middle ground between it, but I certainly understand where it comes from. The idea that you would, you would be calling off sports, but bringing students back. I, I do think like using Indiana as an example, I, I do think Indiana has made a good faith effort to try and make this work. Um, and it, it, it may, it may well be impossible. It may well prove impossible both because of behavior and also just because as you said, it, it's, it's just, you got to put students in dorms. You got to put students in Greek houses. It's, you know, you're going to wind up in situations where it's going to be incredibly difficult. Like, I mean, I lived in a fraternity house in college. How do you serve food in fraternity houses? I mean, it has to be buffet style. Like you cannot, 
you would you, like half the house wouldn't eat if it was made to order. Um, but it still creates this, this, you know, this sort of perfect cocktail of, of disease vectoring. Um, you know, I mean, spend 20 minutes on a college campus and you'll come into contact with all sorts of different colds and flus and different things anyway. Um, you know, Indiana has tried to stand up a, a substantial, uh, testing program to, to the extent that it at least had, it at least had plans for a, uh, an on-campus test processing facility. It was hoping to test as many as 10,000 people a week by the saliva test. Um, you know, it's testing everyone who's coming back to move into any on-campus housing, which I believe includes, uh, Greek housing and it has dorms set aside for quarantine, you know, for, for students who become ill, they go, I think it's, I think it's Ashton uh, over on the east side of campus or whatever that is, west side, north side, I don't know. Um, it, it just, it's just hard to imagine it working. And, and then of course, you know, you, you see these scenes and, and Indiana is not alone in this. We saw it at Alabama you know, I think there were suggestions of it at Notre Dame. I know Purdue has suspended, a, like, I think more than two dozen students already for, for violating social distancing policies and things like that. Um, you know, listen without wanting to be crass. You know, when I was 19, I can't tell you I would have acted much different, you know, if if my friends had a party or, you know, you know, my girlfriend invited me over or, or whatever. I, I can't tell you I, I would have acted too terribly different. Um, I think there's even, you know, to some extent, and again, I don't, I don't want to speak for a large body of people, but I, I, I think there is at least a, a, you know, sort of a prevailing concern that students are just taking the attitude that this isn't going to work. And so they're going to try and have some fun with their friends now, knowing that they'll probably all just get sent home and, you know, college will get shut down before too long um it is just very hard to see it working you know and 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 what's going to be fascinating just from a college sports perspective let's be clear i'm not talking about you know public health but just from a college sports perspective as we talk about that is now we have bubbles or at least relative bubbles if campus is shut down your athletes don't have to co-mingle with the the wider population of course they still may um, you know, they still may have parties or whatever, but you can at very least get yourself to a place where it's down to their personal responsibility, much more so than it is about having to attend class, having to attend lectures, labs, whatever. Um, and so maybe then there's a better chance at, at playing sports. Um, but then you get into all sorts of ethical questions about whether or not basically the NCAA's amateurism mission is really being served if you're playing sports when classes aren't in session. It's, it, you know, we're, we're just, we're coming up against quandary after quandary, but I, I think that the, the biggest one for higher education is just going to be that, as you say, it's exceptionally difficult to imagine a scenario where this, you know, this, this works for any length of time. So the next kind of thing that I think is on the radar, radar for both of us is what's going to happen with college basketball, because, you know, at, at Indiana, uh, it, it's, it's unique. Um, in college sports, you know, it's one of the, you know, handful of programs where, where basketball is, is, is the king um, on campus. And, and, you know, there's been a lot of discussion already. Uh, Dan Gavitt's, you know, given multiple interviews to Andy Katz and various folks about just kind of all these contingency plans. I, I think that's been encouraging from the standpoint of it, it looks like the NCAA and, and I'll say I'll say that right now it looks like because we have no idea what exactly is going on behind the scenes. We ha we've seen nothing in terms of a plan, um, but it looks like they're being a little bit more proactive uh, than the conferences were for college football. Uh, college football uh, in many ways was, was rightly criticized because, you know, they had all this time to figure something out and, and uh, some of it obviously is dependent on just the virus and the situation there, but it also kind of looked in, in many ways that uh, you know, they thought maybe it was just going to go away and they'd be able to operate business as usual. You know, the hope is that college basketball is coming up with something, um, 
a little bit uh, more concrete on, on what they're going to do in contingency plans from where we sit right now. And, and I think you'd probably agree with me, Zach. I see no way that we're starting in early November with a college basketball season. There's no real way, way to justify having all these buy games, these preseason tournaments, like say the battle for Atlantis or Maui, where you have basically destination games where, where, you know, a lot of it's fueled by tourism and, and getting fans there. Um, for that reason, um, I am a little bit intrigued by some of the discussion, you know, Mark Emmert mentioning a bubble, uh, Dan Gavitt saying, you know, we're going to do everything we can to get the NCAA tournament play played. What, what are you, what are your just kind of thoughts um, on when you can see, uh, obviously they've, they've kind of given us mid September as a date where maybe we'll know some more about kind of what the plan is, but, but what do you see as maybe the most viable and, and um, strategy for getting a season started? Um, do you think it's conference only? Um, and I'm, and I know I'm asking, kind of putting you on the spot here to kind of see the future, but I'm just kind of curious what your, what your thoughts are as we kind of move into this next uh, phase. And at Indiana, it's obviously the, the, something that a lot of people are going to be interested in is, is what this college basketball season looks like. Well, I think, um, you know, I think you're right about football. It, it, I think football, again, made a good faith effort. And in fairness to football, football had absolutely no blueprint, you know, to operate with. Um, and football is also just a different animal. You're talking about a lot more people. I mean, just like, you know, five, six times, seven times uh, more total individuals that need to be kept around a program and kept safe and kept sort of sequestered as much as possible. Um compared um compared to you know a, a football program basketball will get the benefit of of seeing what worked and what failed for football and and that was always going to be the case of course by the uh, virtue of the calendar and so i think you can maybe have a little bit more hope in a basketball season you know it was interesting um, archie miller floated the idea of like could there be conference only from thanksgiving weekend um you know i mean you, you mentioned the uh, the Maui Invitational. I don't know what Maui's doing. I probably should reach out and ask, but like Stanford's in the Maui field. Stanford's not playing basketball till 2021. The, the Pac-12 has already called off all sports for the rest of the calendar year. Now the Big 12 has, or excuse me, the Big 10 hasn't done that yet. Um, but the point is when you talk about non-conference seasons, the, you know, many of them are already busted up. And, and, you know, I think what you're probably going to see is the big conferences move to conference only schedules. Maybe, maybe, you create exceptions so that Louisville can still play Kentucky or, you know, uh, IU can still play Butler in the, in the crossroads classic, something like that. But that would be probably about it. Um, you know, I, I don't see, you know, just, just call it an educated guess, but I don't see anything beyond that at this point in terms of non-conference what I do think people should be prepared for is the NCAA to take a much, much more active role um, in this than in football. And that's, that's for a couple of reasons. One is structural. Um, since the early mid eighties, the big football schools have been sort of siphoning power away from the NCAA when it, with regard to football, obviously the NCAA, you know, organizes rule structures and enforces recruiting guidelines and those sorts of things. But, you know, football is, is, as a, as a sport in the way that it is, is scheduled and played is constructed almost entirely by the conferences. They negotiate their own television deals. You know, they, along with the sponsors and the, the networks, the broadcasters negotiate uh, most of the bowl field, you know, they are responsible for the, you know, basically the, the sort of year to year execution of a football season. Basketball is still the NCAA's domain. Um, the NCAA tournament is an NCAA championship. It is run by the NCAA and it is what makes the NCAA money. Um, I mean, to the tune of like, I, I think I want to say maybe 900 million last year, something like that. Um, except not, well, excuse me, two years ago, here there was no tournament and the NCAA had insurance to cover that. Uh, to a point that it did not make up for all lost revenue. It did make up for some, but the NCAA can't afford a second canceled tournament. Now that, I mean, that's just what this comes down to. The NCAA needs to find a way to play the tournament because for financial, and I guess possibly political reasons, and this may be me going out on a limb a little bit, but when we talk about the 
between the Power Five and the NCAA, the NCAA tournament is still one of the big cards that the NCAA has in its deck in, in that struggle. And you start to lose that, you know, does that, does that push the power five even further away from the NCAA? Again, I, I might be out over my skis a little bit there, but um, more than anything else, the NCAA just needs to find a way to have a basketball postseason, men's and, and women's as well, because that's where the vast majority of the association's budget comes from, as well as certainly its political power. It lost that last year. Everyone understood why it lost that, of course, but to, to lose it two years in a row, I think would be very, very damaging. So basketball has always been, not always, but, you know, certainly in, in kind of the, our modern context in college sports, basketball has been the, the Big Ten's, you know, sort of corner of the store, so to speak, much more so than football. So do not be surprised when you see the, the NCAA taking a much more active role in basketball. It's, it's not because they weren't prepared to lead on football. It's not because they weren't interested in leading on football. It's because this is the area where they have a lot more power and authority. Do you have any preference from just a logistical standpoint um, in terms of having a conference only season, trying to play some non-conference games? I mean, in terms of equity when coming up with a tournament field next season, to me, it would seem to create a lot of issues if you're going to play conference only games just from standpoint of figuring out who's deserving of making the tournament I mean you know the baseline every year for how we kind of view the leagues going into conference season is what they did in a non-conference and if you have leagues just playing themselves I don't know exactly how that sorts out how do you kind of view the um, the format of the season and is there any importance uh, in your mind to to try to get some of those non-conference games in or should the focus be mostly on just trying to to do this in the in the most safe way possible and 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 figure out a way just to have the tournament what if if that means not playing non-conference games and and do you have any thoughts on you know to talk about these bubbles do you think that is you know there's been some people that have come out and said well if there's no way it can work you're you're doing this with unpaid athletes and there's other people who think well you know Mark Emmert has actually mentioned it so to me it, it seems like something they're actually discussing do you think that's at all viable? It's clearly on their minds. Um, I, I've said since the spring that I think the idea of bubbling athletes would create a serious challenge to the notion of amateurism. And I, and I mean, a legal challenge. I mean, someone, I mean, a lawyer somewhere wanting to approach someone about challenging on legal grounds, the idea of amateurism, if you do that now, you know, maybe in their most candid moments, leaders in college athletics would say, well, listen, you know, this is the direction of travel we've been on for a while here. We're starting to basically be forced into a corner by Congress on NIL and, and, you know, athlete welfare and compensation. So, so maybe, maybe the solution here is just to sort of rip the bandaid off and, you know, go forward um, and, and we'll figure it out as, as we progress, but let's, let's survive this, you know, catastrophe right now. And then as we come out of it, we'll look at reforms that, you know, frankly, we're probably kind of being forced into by political and public sentiment anyway. Um, I think with regard to the structure of the season, the first thing you've got to do, you've got to work backward. Like the first thing you've got to do is decide what's the NCAA tournament look like. Because when Mark Emmert was talking, I think he was talking to Andy, Andy Katz in an interview that was published on NCAA.com. You know, he was saying, well, if we do do a bubble, 64 teams would be difficult. That's, that's a lot of teams to put into, into one quote unquote bubble situation, but maybe we could do 32. We could certainly do 16. Um, so the first question you have to ask is what do you want the tournament to look like? Do you want it to be like four bubbles of 16 teams and then four teams come out of those, those, those pods and then you send them to another bubble and you play a Sweet 16 Elite Eight Final Four National Championship game over the space of like two weeks, um, you know, maybe even less than that. And when you lose, you're out of the bubble. I don't know. But that's where you need to start. Because if you're going to have, let's say, a 64-team field somehow, well, then you can probably sort of adapt our more traditional system uh, of, of, you know, picking teams you know, maybe even just say, hey, what we'll do is we're just going to take the net, we're going to take Kimpom, we're going to take KPI, we're going to take uh, BPI, 
and we're going to take RPI and we're just going to average them all together for one year. You're in if, you know, we're, we're just going to pick based on averages and you're in if that, whatever. You start pairing the, comp, the, the tournament down, then I think that's where you could potentially get into saying, well, we're going to need an automatic qualifier from every league. You know, the, the league champion, regular season conference, we'll figure that out. They get an automatic qualifying bid. Um, and then maybe from there we're picking, you know, a few of the, the extra at-larges and, and acknowledging up front that it's likely that, you know, with one or two exceptions, it will be a very sort of high major heavy field. Um, but you've got to – I think the first thing you've got to figure out is what do you – what is the format of your tournament? Do you even build almost like a, a, a you know, a section of the tournament that's just for mid-major schools? I don't know. Um, but I think the first thing you got to do is figure out how you want to structure that thing and then work backward from there to be able to, you know, sort of communicate with your, uh, with your schools. So I think that's going to be the other thing too, is, and again, something maybe we've learned from the big 10 struggles in the last couple of weeks, you're going to need to communicate. Don't leave ambiguity for coaches because they will complain about it. Um, and, and because you also need to, you know, like, I I think this is almost a season where it would frankly behoove the selection committee to come out before the season started and say, listen, we have sat down, we've had a, you know, a series of virtual meetings. We have decided these are the criteria by which we will be selecting the field. And so, you know, go forward accordingly. So coaches, coaches can't have, you know, can't sit there and wonder, well, will it be our road record? You know, will it be our losses? Well, I mean, like, I think it's a year where the selection committee could be justified in saying like, you know, the first thing we will do is, 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 you know, consider all teams with no more than two Ken Palm top, you know, uh, Ken Palm one one oh one plus losses. And then we'll move through all those teams and then we'll go down to this and then we'll go down to this and we'll go down to this. Um, but I think there needs to be as much clarity as possible because there's really just not going to be any way if there is no substantial non-conference season to be comparative in this, you know, the, the big 10 is probably the toughest it's been in seven years right now. So if let's say the big 10 winds up playing a 24 game league schedule with, um, or let's just say a 26 game league schedule, total round Robin from the beginning, from the weekend after Thanksgiving, everybody plays everybody home and away. Plus you get, you know, two non-conference games uh, or one non-conference game, whatever, if you want it. Well, you know, yeah, if Indiana comes out of that 15 and 13, then it stands to reason Indiana should be in the tournament. But then you probably are going to have some team in, in the Missouri Valley that, you know, runs a table and, and goes 23 and three. And everybody's going to say, well, why aren't we letting the team that's 23 and three? And I, I think it's a year where like you need to be more upfront about how the field's going to be structured, certainly, but also, frankly, how it's going to be picked than you've ever been before. This can't be one of those years where you get to the end of the year and you say, okay, well, these seem to be the criteria that fit this field the most, and that's how we're going to judge these teams. I think it's almost got to be one where the selection committee comes out up front and says, this is what we'll be looking for. You know, the, the, these teams get auto bids, and then from there for the bubble, this is what we'll be looking for because it is just going to be so difficult to cross-compare this season. Zach, we appreciate the time. You can you can follow him on Twitter at Zach Osterman. Uh, read his work in the Indie Star. Subscribe, by the way, to the Indie Star um, at IndieStar.com. Zach, always good to have you on the show. Thanks for your insight, and and hopefully uh, we will uh, we'll see each other at a at a basketball arena uh, this winter at, at some point. That that'd be good. Yeah, who knew we who knew how much I'd be missing Iowa City right now. But yeah, if I could walk into Carver Hawkeye and cover a game, I absolutely would. It's, um, you know, it's a strange time. Um, you know, I can think back to when we, when we called everything off in, in March and, you know, we thought, well, we're going to be doing this for a few weeks. And here we are, what, six months later, um, five months later, I, I've lost track. And, and there's, it's not that there's no end in sight, but it's certainly not like we're going to be walking back into stadiums tomorrow. I, um, I'm, I'm, I'm jealous, frankly, of, you know, and I don't, I don't know if we should be playing high school sports or not. That's, that's a, another 
ethical conversation, but I am a little bit jealous of, of my colleagues who are covering high school football tonight because there's just, there's, I think, very nearly nothing I'd rather do right now than just walk into a stadium and cover a game and have everything seem relatively normal for uh, a couple hours. But we'll get it back. We'll, we'll, we'll be eating those Chick-fil-A sandwiches uh, outside the press room before long. So thanks for maybe, having me may, as always. May, maybe uh, it might be good for us if we uh, go a little bit more time without eating yeah, those okay. Chick-fil-A sandwiches. It might help us a little bit. The, I, I won't miss the mystery meat in the press box at IU football games. That's for sure. I will not can't, miss can't the... Say, can't say I've ever sampled the mystery meat, so... Oh, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely meat-like product. That's for sure. <laughs> Ribs, meat-like product. Tacos, meat-like product. Yeah. If you, if, you, uh, if you team up with J.D. Campbell, you, sometimes you can, you can sneak up to the sixth floor and grab what's being catered to the suites, but uh, most of the time it's the, it's the dodgy-looking hamburgers down on, down on floor five of Memorial Stadium. Thanks, everybody, for listening uh, to this week's episode of Podcast on the Brink. As I've kind of said the last couple episodes, we're, we're going to stick with the every other week schedule uh, for right now. And uh, so we'll see, you, uh, we'll see you next month for an- another episode of, of Podcast on the Brink. Thanks, everybody, for listening, and have a great weekend.